Can you hear me? Okay, we've got the camera in my computer rather than the camera I usually use. So we've got a minor headache in that form, but we'll go for, with that. Okay. The next part of the prayer book as it's laid out in the 1928 prayer book is the Collex Epistles and Gospels. And this is one of those sections where what few changes there have been have been relatively subtle. Uh, for the most part, Cranmer followed the sequence of lessons that were given in the Sarah Missal, but he leaves out many of the holy days. The ones that he leaves are those associated with the apostles and also a small selection of holy days associated with our Lord. And in this particular aspect of how the prayer book is put together, uh, Cranmer is much closer to Lutheran practice than he is to Reformed practice. So although the German Reformed broadly retained the Christian year in the form of retaining things like uh, Christmas, Epiphany, uh, Easter, Ascension, Whit Sunday, Trinity Sunday, they didn't maintain the full traditional sequence of lessons. And as a result of this, Cranmer comes across in this aspect has been a bit more Lutheran. And he retains the serum lessons more or less as they stood. Most of the alterations are to the collect because very often the original Latin collects are extremely limited. Uh, it, it's, it's basically, it's the invocation petition through Jesus Christ, our Lord format, without really giving it an awful lot of meat. And so when Cranmer beefs up the um, collects, epistles and gospels, he often does so by introducing a reference to the epistle or to the gospel, or just simply amplifying the original Latin text. 
Now, the Christian year as it's given in the prayer book consists, of course, of Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, the Gessamer Sundays, Lent, Passion Tide, Easter, Ascension, Pentecost, and Trinity. And most of this sequence goes back to the 6th century, 7th century text that the Sarah Missal ultimately was based on. It's a little bit different arrangement of lessons to what you find in the Roman Missal. So if you happen to have one of those big red books lying around, uh, particularly the English Missal, you'll find it gives the prayer book lessons and then it will give the Roman lessons after it. What you tend to find after Trinity is that the English prayer book is a week off the Roman Missal. And the reason for this was that in Rome, when Trinity Sunday was introduced in the late 15th century, sorry, the, the late 12th century, they added in Trinity Sunday, knocked out the octave of Pentecost, but the week following was still Pentecost 1. So instead, they, um, in England, they moved everything back a week. And so Pentecost 1 becomes Trinity 1, and so it runs through until the 22nd Sunday after Trinity. Um, so minor changes were made both in 1789 and also in 1928. Most of them are eliminations of duplicate lessons or finding something a little bit more appropriate to the day. Um, it should be noted that the English attempted revision of 1928 does pretty much the same thing, but usually makes completely different choices to the American prayer book. Uh, going through the first half of the Christian year, which was all I had time to do when I was stuck at Charlotte last night, um, the first Sunday after Christmas, the epistle is changed to Philippians 2.19. Uh, on Epiphany 2, uh, the American prayer book has Mark 1, chapter 1, not John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Epiphany 3, John 2, chapter 2, verse 1, not Matthew, chapter 8, 1 to 13. Epiphany 4, Matthew 8, rather than Matthew 8, 23. Uh, Maundy Thursday, you have an alternative gospel which totally mucks up Cranmer's sequence for um, Holy Week. Cranmer's sequence for Holy Week is one of his non-traditional bits because what he does is he basically distributes the four passions to be read over the first five days of Holy Week. So you have um, Palm Sunday, Monday in Holy Week, Tuesday in Holy Week, Wednesday in Holy Week, Thursday in Holy Week, and Good Friday all have a section of a passion. So on Good Friday, you get the traditional Good Friday passion, which is John. Luke is divided between Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Mark between Monday and Tuesday, and then you get Matthew on Palm Sunday. The, pa the Palm Gospel in the English prayer book has nothing whatsoever to do with Palm Sunday. It's on Advent Sunday in its traditional place at the beginning of the Christian year. And it's only with the blessing and distribution of palms, which was a separate anti-communion liturgy in the Sarah Missal, that you get the Matthew 21 Gospel for Palm Sunday. It's one of those cases where modern usage, i.e. post-1965, is totally different to the traditional one. Because in the Roman, the old Roman Missal, they have exactly the same reading on Palm Sunday we do. They have the Passion according to Mark. Um, whereas in modern times with the dreaded three-year cycle, three times as book scripture, explained one-third as well, um, 
they have the um, the various accounts of the entry into Jerusalem. And this sort of misunderstands the purpose of Holy Week, which is intended to lead up to the great liturgies of Valdi Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter even. And Cranmer maintains something of the feel of the traditional arrangement at that point. The holy days that are retained in the prayer book are mainly those of the apostles and a few of our Lord or Our Lady, the ones that were originally feasts of Our Lord are uh, our Lady are reclassified as feasts of our Lord. So you have the presentation of Christ in the temple, which gains dominance over the purification of the Virgin Mary in the prayer book, the Annunciation, and then of course Christmas, um, you Ascension, but you don't get Transfiguration in, 19, in 1662. It does not come back into the cycle until uh, 1892. The other holy days are Feasts of the Apostles, so you have the traditional sequence, St. Stephen, uh, John the Evangelist, St. Paul, St. Matthias, uh, St. Mark, Philip and James, Barnabas, John, Peter, James the Great, Bartholomew, Matthew, um, St. Luke, of course, an evangelist, uh, Simon and Jude, apostles, then you have All Saints Day, and then St. Andrew and St. Thomas just before Christmas. Um, the odd one in there, to a certain extent, is Holy Innocence Day, which pr preserves the traditional three days that follow Christmas. So St. Stephen, St. Stephen, St. John, the Holy Innocents, because at the time the 1549 prayer book was produced, the octave of Christmas was still pretty much kept as a holiday. So you have the whole Christmas through Feast of the Circumcision still very much regarded as being sacrosanct as a period of feasting. Um, the 1928 prayer book follows 1789 and 1552 in not having any minor holy days. So it's a very clean calendar in that respect. Um, its most peculiar habit is pushing off things like if Annunciation falls during Holy Week, instead of the old arrangement which goes back into the first millennium that you do say Tuesday in Holy Week and commemorate the Annunciation. Under the 1928 rules, you have to shunt it off to the Monday following Low Sunday, which as happened this year, uh, you ended up keeping the Feast of the Annunciation around about April the 9th. So it sort of completely divorces it from its usual place, you know, nine months before Christmas. Um, the other thing that you'll find in the Christian year as it's laid out in the prayer book is you have these funny little uh, three-day octaves. So you have Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, Easter Tuesday, uh, Whit Sunday, Whit Monday, Whit Tuesday. And this had become a very strong tradition in Northern Europe. The feast was prolonged over the three days. And the Anglicans were not the only ones to retain these. They survived in uh, Germany well into the 18th century, actually better than they did in England, because the um, German, the big city churches in Germany tended to divide up into districts so that, you know, if Sunday was your day if you lived in the north of town, Monday was your day if you lived in the west, if you lived in the rest, it was Tuesday. So you didn't end up with a tremendous glut of Easter communions on Easter Sunday. The orders, as usual, the, the order of lessons remains as it had been in the Sarah Missal. The two slightly strange omissions when you compare uh, 
the English calendar with Lutheran calendars is that you don't get the visitation or St. Mary Magdalene in the English calendar or in the 1928 calendar. And they generally were retained in Germany. So it's a case of Cranmer is very much following the precedent set by Osiander in Nuremberg. But Cranmer being Cranmer, he's doing it in his own way. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up what I have to say about the Christian year. The next section of the prayer book deals with the rites of initiation. And I'm glad I only have to say that phrase about twice this evening, because that's when I can really fall over. Uh, the rites of initiation, basically you are talking about uh, baptism, the uh, two offices of instruction, and confirmation. And the history of those is a little bit in terms of the of the 1928 prayer book, a case of trying to make things better by making them worse. The 1928 Office of Baptism is basically that of 1789. And the 1789 prayer book has some fairly significant differences from the 1662. And a lot of that has to do with the tendency of the American church to be quite latitudinarian. That's an 18th century word for liberal. And the result is that the right you get is much cleaner than that of the 1662 prayer book, but it retains less historical material. So, one interesting comparison is at the beginning. Uh, the English service kind of begs the question, has this child been baptized or no? Uh, it's not asked explicitly, but it is in the 1928. Then the opening prayers are basically the same, and then there is the big omission from the 16, 1789 order, which is the famous flood prayer of Martin Luther, which runs, Almighty and everlasting God, who of thy great mercy did save Noah and his family in the ark from perishing by water, and also did lit safely lead the children of Israel, thy people, through the Red Sea, figuring thereby the ho thy holy baptism, and by the baptism of thy well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in the river Jordan, did sanctify water to the mystical washing away of sin. We beseech thee for thine infinite mercies, that thou wilt mercifully look upon this child, wash him and sanctify him with the Holy Ghost, that he, being delivered by from thy wrath, may be received into the ark of Christ's church, and being steadfast in faith, joyful through hope, and rooted in charity, may so pass the waves of this troublesome world, that finally he may come to the land of everlasting life, there to reign with thee, world without end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the 1789 prayer book just plain old blows that off. The interesting thing about Luther's flood prayer is you don't just find it in Lutheran liturgies. Uh, you find it, for example, in the baptism office that was used by the church in the Palatinate and it gets adapted to the Reformed liturgies in Germany because it's seen as demonstrating the covenantal aspect of baptismal theology. Um, the next prayer, Almighty, Almighty and Immortal God, the aid of all who need, um, is basically the same between 1928 and 1662. The choice of gospel is the same, uh, except that 1928 provides an alternative in the form of John chapter 3. I'm just having a quick crib here because I've got a funny little feeling that that's one of those things that happened. Yeah, when they knocked the two 
forms of baptism, the baptism of infants and the baptism of adults together. So in the 1662 prayer book, John chapter 3 is the one that's used for the baptism of adults. Uh, Mark chapter 10 is used for the baptism of infants. Then, of course, because they can't um, resist making little changes, we get uh, Matthew 28 as a third alternative. Uh, the office proceeds pretty much the same in 1928 and 1662 after that. Uh, one of the things that has to be remembered about the baptismal office is that um, the 1662 prayer book does make some slight changes from 1559. Um, they're not significant, they're mainly verbal, and a lot of these changes carried over into 1789 without being questioned. The one big change in 1928 is the passage beginning, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit, lift up thy, your hearts, we lift them up unto the Lord, let us give thanks unto our Lord God, it is meet and right so to do. And this gives kind of a proper preface, because it's very similar in wording at first, to the proper preface that you have in the communion service in preparation for the actual baptism. And the latter part of it is based on the prayer that is uh, provided in the 62 service for the blessing of the font or the blessing of the water. Now, the blessing of, the, of water, I didn't have a chance to check this, but one of the things that you might like to check is whether or not it's there in 1559. I've got a funny feeling, just trying to see if my 1559 is within grabbing distance. I have got a funny feeling, it is, aha, that the blessing of the font was absent in 1559. And this, if it is, just give me two seconds here. Yeah, it's missing in 1559, which was due to the influence of Butzer. Uh, one of his criticisms in the inappropriately named censura of the 1549 was it retained the blessing of the font. It comes back again in a milder form in uh, 1662. Just let me. Sorry, I keep turning to the private baptism of infants instead of the public, which is not helping the process here. Um, which is a uh, which is expanded in 1928 to provide the modern losing that using that term loosely the the modern sort of proper preface come blessing for. Uh, of the water for baptism and this is something that tends to be missing from reformed rites and present in Lutheran rites so it's not as though they're doing something you know unreformed but what they're what happens is that in 1552 and 1559 Butzer's council prevails, then in 1662 they go back to a more Lutheran form of the service. The baptism then follows, and then the child is signed with the cross and formally welcomed into the congregation. Now one interesting thing that tends to happen with the baptismal service is it becomes the focus of an awful lot of controversy in the middle of the 19th century. Um, the reason for this is that our old friend, the Tractarian, took the rather definite and positive language about baptism in the Book of Common Prayer and used it as an argument to say that baptism functions ex, op, ex opera operata, 
and as such, they riled up the evangelicals. And the two of them had a very happy war from about 1848 through to 1873. And strangely, it's this controversy between the evangelicals and the Tractarians that uh, is the background to the formation of the Reformed Episcopal Church. It became the flashpoint issue because evangelicals had never really given the language of the prayer book a second thought with regards to baptismal regeneration until the Tractarians started using it as a club to beat them with. Because if you look at the Reformed uh, Confessions of Faith, such as the Second Helvetic, um, the Belgic Confession, even the Scots Confession of 1560, they associate regeneration with baptism. It is the effectual sign, the sacramental sign of regeneration. What they don't insist on, which the Tractarians tended to pretend that they did, was that baptism is the means of regeneration, not the effectual sign. And so the evangelicals start pushing back in the opposite direction. Now, the problem with this is that it leads to the evangelicals in Anglicanism losing half of their traditional baptismal theology. They lose the sense of baptism as being the sacrament of regeneration. It becomes rather straightforwardly incorporation into the covenant. On the other hand, the Tractarians so emphasize regeneration that they lose the covenantal side of baptism. So one of the things that you have to watch when you are discussing baptismal theology in Anglicanism is preserving this tension between the covenantal theology that comes out of the Reformed tradition and the idea of baptismal regeneration, which of course in a, is scriptural, uh, John chapter 3, um, but isn't necessarily associated in a mechanical way with the actual pouring of the water and the saying of the prayers. The um, actually in one of its rare moments of straightforward conservatism, the Declaration of Principles of the Reformed Episcopal Church states what had been the traditional position of Anglican divines since the 16th century, which simply says, uh, regeneration does not invariably accompany the rite of baptism. Uh, the exact wording being It says, fifthly, um, this church condemns and rejects the following erroneous and strange doctrines as contrary to God's word. Fifthly, that regeneration is inseparably connected with baptism. And that would have been regarded as nothing controversial, actually even in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, before the 19th century, though Roman Catholics would have argued that it was in order for baptism not to stick, there would have to be a defect of intention or a deliberately formed will on the part of the recipient not to receive the grace of the sacrament. But, you know, the evangelicals of the mid-19th century were not being that far out there. Now, if we take a look at the promises that are made in the baptismal office, it's the traditional three. Dost thou reject the devil and all his works? Dost thou accept the Christian faith as described in the Apostles' Creed? Wilt thou keep the commandments? But it's actually split up into four questions in the uh, American 28. For the baptism of infants, the questions are addressed to the sponsors. Uh, for the baptism of adults, to the person being baptized. 
as I mentioned earlier, the flood prayer is omitted. Uh, and then there are a series of petitions that basically the grace of the sacrament, or if you prefer, the, uh, the, the grace of regeneration be uh, given to the person being baptized. One thing that often gets missed is a, cure, a little word in the rubric just before the actual baptism. It's the word dip. And it reflects the common late medieval English practice of, we did not pour at that point, we dunked. And if you look at a lot of medieval fonts, they have a uh, bowl that is about yay wide and yay deep and they would fill that thing just about to the brim and splosh the child would be baptized by immersion um, a fusion or pouring if you prefer uh, is generally post med late very late medieval or post reformation uh, and the older the font in england the bigger it tends to be um, immersion again became fashionable amongst evangelicals in the 19th century. I wonder why. And uh, there's a few places in England where you go in and as you walk across the back of the church, you find yourself walking on wooden boards because there's a baptismal tank down there, in addition to the conventional uh, font. 18th century fonts, unfortunately, were generally bird baths. Uh, so they weren't suitable for any, in any way, shape, or form for immersion. It should never, ever, the, the impression should never, ever be given that immersion is not an Anglican thing to do. It is. Uh, although it's a bit awkward with adults sometimes. Although I saw a good, good uh, photograph on the internet. Uh, an army chaplain was um, baptizing by immersion in the bucket on a earth mover. Well, when you're in the field, you do what you've got to do. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up my very brief survey of the baptismal office. Now, in the 1662 prayer book, the private baptism of infants and the uh, baptism of such as are of riper years, in other words, adults or older children, uh, constitute fully separate services. Uh, in the 1928, they're given as modifications or variants of a single baptismal office, which theologically is the better arrangement, but it can be a bit awkward when you're doing it. Now, the next thing you get in the 1662 prayer book is the Catechism. That is replaced in the 1928 by the Offices of Instruction. And I can't say I am the world's biggest fan of either. The difficulty with the two Offices of Instruction is, well, you're back to the old joke, what's a camel, a horse designed by a committee? And although much of the old prayer book um, material survives, it's sort of chopped up in an awkward way. So instead of the very clear structure that you have with most Reformation era catechisms, where you deal with the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments in an orderly manner, it gets split up between the office, two offices, kind of to touch turn them into a, a, a quasi-children's service. Uh, unfortunately, the, the attempt is not altogether successful, and the error is compounded by the fact the section on the Lord's Prayer in the Catechism is completely left out of the two offices of instruction. That said, they can be very useful. Uh, personally, I rarely use them. I prefer the old Catechism, so... You know, I just nailed my colours to the mast on that one. Um, the English Catechism is printed in the 1928 prayer book in what I refer to as the orphans section of the uh, 1928 prayer book, which is the material they stick in the back after the Psalter. 
Um, and certainly the 1928 Offices of Instruction are a useful supplement to the Catechism, but don't abandon the Catechism. It provides some material that isn't in the Offices of Instruction. The Offices of Instruction and the Catechism all bear a family resemblance to the catechisms that were written during the Reformation, except they're not quite as full. And there was always a sense of inadequacy that hung around the prayer book catechism in that very quickly after it was incorporated into the prayer book, you have Noel's catechism appearing, I think in 1569, which is basically um, about to about 120 pages, or maybe a little more than that, which attempted to fill out the prayer book catechism by giving a more thorough overview of um, the theology of the Church of England. Um, Noel's catechism certainly should be something we start looking at again. But really, in some respects, uh, in regards to its content, it's not an awful lot different to the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, it's, it's within that sort of broad family of Reformation-era catechisms. And of course, you know perfectly well the reason why the catechism is between baptism and confirmation, because it's what you had to learn between baptism and confirmation. Uh, it's the didactic tendencies of the um, reformers at work once again. Now, the Office of Confirmation, let's get the old joke out of the way first. Confirmation is a sacrament looking for a theology, or, a, or an ordinance looking for a theology. Um... We don't really have that problem. That's kind of one that's been produced by the uh, modern day liturgiologists. But one of the things you have to admit is that in a sense, the uh, right of confirmation is, the, is accidental. And it's an accident of history. In the early days of the church, when the church was mainly an, uh, an urban organization, the bishop was intimately connected with the rite of baptism. So if you go to Italy and look at the older cathedrals right next door to the cathedral church, there will be a very often a very large baptistry attached with an immersion font because baptism was solemnly administered twice a year, uh, Easter and Pentecost, and it was a big deal in the early church. And of course, you had what you have in the right today. You have, you know, the renunciation of Satan, you know, professing the creed. Uh, you have the candidates questioned as to whether they desire to be baptized. They are baptized. They are signed with the cross later on. They add in the exorcisms before the baptism. Then they are anointed by the bishop. And when the church went from being an urban organization to being a rural organization as it spread into northern and eastern Europe, they had wanted to maintain this connection of the bishop with the rite of baptism somehow. And the East and the West came up with totally different solutions to the problem. The East slightly altered the baptism, so it was done by the priest, but the anointing was done by the priest with oils blessed by the bishop, which in modern times has become known as chrismation. Well, actually in ancient times it was known as chrismation. We've become familiar with it in the West in modern times. In the East, the anointing and laying on of hands by the bishop became a separate rite, which occurred at some point after baptism. Now, in the case of Elizabeth I, when she was baptized on the 10th of September, 1533, she was confirmed immediately after her baptism. 
usually in the late Middle Ages, children would confirm around about the age of reason, say seven, eight, somewhere in there. Uh, and bishops were often very sloppy about the way in which confirmation was administered. I mean, there are stories about bishops confirming children from horseback. Um, so it was one of those things that the reformers felt they had to do something about. The Lutherans in general abolished confirmation, the reformed in general retained it because it was seen by them as providing an opportunity for an individual to reaffirm and to take upon themselves their baptismal vows, to, uh, to affirm their faith. And you can see in the way the rite is structured, both in 1662 and in 1928, that there's very much this idea of taking upon yourself the faith that was professed in your name at your baptism as an infant. One nice change in the 1928 is we don't have the rubric turned into an exaltation that we have in 1662. Um, broadly, the two rites are very similar. Um, the questioning as contained in the 1928, they add a second question basically by dividing and filling out the one question that's asked in the 1662. Um, confirmation ends with the blessing of the candidates. Um, in Anglican usage, holy oils do not have to be used in confirmation. A lot of bishops choose to do it, but it's, you know, it's, an extra, it's not required by the bread. And I think it basically only became popular in the late 70s, early 80s. I remember the bishop who confirmed me certainly had absolutely no intention of using oils um, when he did confirmations because he ain't never done it that way. Um, confirmation contains some language that reflects the late medieval belief that confirmation conferred the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you have a sort of loose mention of that in the prayer that immediately precedes the laying on of hands. And the rite ends with a blessing of the candidates, uh, which is used irrespective of whether confirmation is used as a freestanding rite um, within the church's year. When you use it in comfort, when you use confirmation during morning and evening prayer, rather logically, I think it should go after the second lesson like baptism is supposed to do, because of the association between baptism and confirmation. Uh, where to put confirmation when celebrated alongside the Eucharist is a bit more problematic. If you go by analogy with the ordinal, you put it right at the beginning. So you sort of go, okay, confirmation as the commissioning of the laity comes at the beginning of the service because you do deacons after the epistle and you do priests after the gospel. Yeah. Or alternatively, you can regard it as a response to the proclamation of the gospel. So, you know, another place putting is either before or after the creed. I'm not really that bothered, but I do know that when they reorganize and optionalized um, confirmation in the 1979 prayer book and also in the alternative service book in England, they made a right mess of it. It became basically a form of ordination and they overemphasized the Holy Spirit act aspect and underemphasized the um, aspect of taking upon oneself baptismal promises. Um, that basically is the end of my comments on the rites of initiation. That's the second time I have to say that tonight. Um, next week, we look at the other pastoral offices, uh, matrimony, visitation of the sick, communion of the sick, and burial of the dead. And each one of those 
uh, presents its own set of challenges because this is where, in many respects, Cranmer had to heavily rework the traditional usages because, you know, the focus with visitation of the sick in the late Middle Ages, it had moved to the point where it became extreme unction. Uh, matrimony was very preoccupied with the avoidance of sin uh, and communion of the sick had become, you know, from the reserve sacrament and the burial of the dead, of course, the requiem mass, they had to do something really serious about that at the Reformation. So that's the end of our part one on the occasional offices. So question time. Uh, yeah, I only have about 300 for you. Oh. Airport floor last night. <laughs> Don't confuse me when you're asking the questions. All right, so um, I, I am definitely going to have a question on the anointing of oil. I know that was like you said a later oil, but that, you know, for consecrating, but, you know, the very Old Testament, you see that very early on. Um, I know, like you said about your bishop, didn't have that, but, um, you know, I've always looked at that as being very historic and curious about, you know, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. I also have another question for you that's killing me as well, but I'm going to ask you that one first because that was like near the end on, um, do you see because a, we look at the Old Testament we see, you know, oil being used to uh, anoint uh, Aaron, and then we look at um, David, we look at, I think Saul, I, I got to go back, I don't, I don't remember, but I know David was, oil was poured on him. In the Old Testament, they're anointed with oil. Yeah. Uh, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Saul the king. Um... Anointing is very ancient, but by the late med Middle Ages, it had become so overlain with superstition that the reformers tended to minimize it, if not abolish it. Uh, the Swedes retained it for about 20 years after the Reformation. Same with Prussia. Um, in England, it went fairly quickly. I think it's between 1549 and 1559. It never completely disappeared because there is one occasional office, the coronation of the monarch, where oil was always used. So it was not completely abolished. Its use was minimized because of medieval superstition. Partial restoration, well, restoration of the use of oils uh, in baptism, in confirmation as an option, certainly doesn't throw up any issues. Well, that was my next point on two, two points on the communion, I mean, um, baptism, because I use oil in baptism as well, and... Um, and I know, and I wanted to get uh, some of your thoughts. I mean, if you know, you've seen all my pictures on law, and I do immersion, usually in a river or somewhere. And I know from early English history, I've read a couple of places where they actually used barrels. <laughs> Five, six, seven hundred A.D., and you get dunk in the barrel. Well, you say that was because they were baptizing adults. And yeah the size of a font they were big enough for infants because it was a christianized society and, and and i've argued this point with with a lot of people that i said it doesn't say anywhere in the scriptures you have to be totally immersed this is you have to be baptized with water um and and so of, of doing that with you know the infants uh and then you brought up the point about baptizing or immersion with infants is uh, brings up the really good question of the argument because I say all that are all if I, if I pour water on you and baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, 
you're validly baptized and infant baptism has been since the beginning of the church. But right. you get a lot of arguments. We got, you know, we're in the South. We got Baptists. We got a lot of other groups that don't believe that. Where, where do we, where's our full stance as Anglicans? The analogy, on, is, the analogy is circumcision. I take a very traditional reformed line on this. Um, there is an analogy between um, circumcision in the Old Testament and baptism in the New Testament. Just as uh, circumcision brought you into the covenant, was the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament, so baptism is the sign of the covenant in the New Testament. And what you get in Acts and elsewhere, you get these casual mentions of family being baptized. And you're not telling me it was always mother, father, servants, and, and teenage children. So the whole household came into the covenant. There's also very little evidence in these early accounts of baptism that everybody was on the same page in regards to their development in the faith at the point in which they're baptized. It's the head of the household that makes the decision and the household is baptized. We think in way too individualistic terms and you don't get this big argument about infant baptism until you get Thomas Munzer and the Anabaptists running around in the mid 1520s reinventing the wheel because they are part of the cult of individuality which comes out of the Renaissance, which comes out of uh, Christian humanism, and they put the really they put the cart before the sacramental horse because they make the consent of the individual more important than the incorporation of the person into the covenant and that really does not sit well with the witness of the early fathers scripture and the old testament scriptures as well that's the real short swift and dirty version of that well, I ask you um, just real quickly because I mean, I, I, and I already got you. I'm going to ask a stupid question, and 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 Father Paul might even jump in. I don't know, but um, so one of the arguments they all state, and um, and and I fight this quite often. You know, when you're talking to people on this subject of, of Southern traditions, is that so? If you wanted to convert to Judaism, or being a Jew, and Paul, you went to the temple, and he took, took the guys down there. Even today, you're fully baptized and raising up, which represents crossing um, the Red Sea and, and the cleansing of that. Um, and then of also that John the Baptist, through his baptism, supposedly pointed the way because of repentance you had to be fully washed and dunked into that you know because he's just pointing the way to repentance that you had to repent of your sins go and sin no more and then but you were not saved but they point to that but then now that we get to the nicodemus verse which basically just says um, the, the point of being baptized in the water and then baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that full immersion is still a requirement um, because that is the tradition that was laid down in Jewish tradition and of uh, John the Baptist. The, the and, very word baptism kind of knocks a hole in that argument because it simply means washed and a, some of the surviving wall paintings from early synagogues when they show ritual washing people are stood in the water and they're having water poured over their head so you know arguing that the word baptism in the new testament means attempted drowning um is 
not a very good argument at all. The word simply means to be washed, and such ritual ablutions often took the form of pouring water over the individual's head. Certainly some of the early um, Christian illustrations of Christ being baptized. <coughs> Some of them show Jesus having water poured over his head rather than being immersed. So, you know, it's really rather difficult to make a, a, a watertight argument uh, from that. Um, the other thing is, is if you look at the early fathers, um, some fathers talk about living water which implies pouring or baptizing in a stream. Um, other fathers talk about immersion. The point is the person gets washed. How is immaterial? May I? May I pop? Yeah, jump in. Okay. Um, this is simply a companion to what his grace was saying. I'm not going to get into the the etymology of the word baptism. If you want, if you really want to do a serious study, there's a book by James. Excuse me. There's a there's a four volume set by James Dale. It covers every historical period and every theological argument of baptism, and it has never been refuted by anybody. As a matter of fact, most evangelicals, Anabaptists, or Baptists refuse to even refer to it because they can't answer it. So that'll take care of the linguistic element. The problem that Baptists have in this argument is a very simple one, and that is this. When we look at John, the beginning of John, and we see the inauguration of Jesus's ministry, John's in the Jordan and he's baptizing, correct? Yeah. What's John doing? It's a baptism of what? Repentance. It's a proselyte baptism. It's the first step in someone coming out of a false worldview or a sinful situation and then being brought into the covenant, then being brought into the nation of Israel. This is why the Pharisees were so irritated with John. And this is why John was irritated with the Pharisees. Remember what John said. He looked up at the banks of the Jordan, and what, he, what did he say? Who warned you of the coming judgment, you den of vipers? In other words, who warned you to repent and come back to the faith? That's the first half of the problem. The second half is then Jesus coming down, and the exchange between John and Jesus, where John says, wait a minute, we need to flip the script. You need to do me. And Jesus said, what? No. We need to make all of righteousness transpire. It has to occur. Why? It wasn't because Jesus needed to repent. It is because Jesus in his incarnation needed to completely identify with humanity in every single way. And this was one of the ways in which he identified with humanity. What the Baptists never point out is that after a proselyte baptism, you still had to get circumcised. Yeah. So the argument for John's baptism being the precursor to Christian baptism is wrong. The precursor to Christian baptism is, as the Archbishop pointed out, circumcision. You find that in Colossians chapter 2. All you have to do is read Colossians chapter 2. Paul makes it very clear. The other thing that is a problem with the Baptists and baptism is if you look at the Savoy Confession and the 1689 London Confession, Baptists do not have the same, well, they don't really have sacraments, they have ordinances. And as such, they do not see ordinances as being, as we would see a sacrament. We see a sacrament as the outward sign of an inward spiritual grace. To them, an ordinance is more of a memorial or a public declaration. 
See, the difficulty is they view it as subjective. We view sacraments as having an objective element. They are given to us by God for the means of receiving the grace that he provides to us. They reject that. I'm sorry, you Grace, I didn't mean to interrupt. Whereas the Baptist view is the, the ordinances are a public profession of a grace that has already been received. So uh, sacramental theology is from the view of the church going all the way back to at least Ignatius of Antioch. It is backwards. And when he cites Ignatius of Antioch, he's talking about the first century. And, and um, Father Paul, I, I, I'm going to say this in a crude way. Because uh, it's a bit of holy crap, dude. I mean, what you just said just really, like, uh, really woke me up because I've studied quite a bit on this baptism part of Jesus. And then I really focus in on the second part about, you know, the Holy Spirit des descending upon him. And then, but, but the Holy Spirit never leaves him. But we look at what you just talked about was a whole new. And, and I thought about this before. It's like, why did Jesus need to be baptized? Because he was sinless. But it was basically of the humanity, of taking humanity, which is a whole different concept that I've never thought about before in terms of that. And I hope everybody kind of grasped what you were talking about. That Christ's baptism is, in a sense, analogous to his crucifixion. Christ died the sinless for the sinner in the same way the sinless Christ received the baptism of repentance for us sinners. It, it, it's the identification of Christ with humanity because without the complete um, identification of Christ with humanity, both through the incarnation and through his um, life and witness, if anything essential is left out of that witness, it impairs the completeness of God's redemption of humanity. And this is why um, one of the most important books written in the, in the 20th century was Gustav Orlam, uh, Christus Victor, because it revived after centuries of sterile argument between competing theories of the atonement. Um, it revitalized the understanding of the whole of Christ's life and ministry as being, re earthly life and ministry as being redemptive. And this is something that, you know, if, if there's one thing really positive that came out of 20th century theology, it's that recovery of the Christus Victor theory of the atonement, which is the dominant theory amongst the early fathers. And the whole idea of Christ's earthly ministry from beginning to end as being redemptive, not just the hours that he spent on the cross. And, and here is something that is, is unfortunately overlooked Whenever we talk about uh, any of the sacraments, uh, we'll focus on baptism. The Archbishop covered the atonement um, sufficiently. We'll talk about baptism. He's already mentioned the household concept. If, if Christus Victor resolved <laughs> a lot of the challenges within the discussion of the atonement, Joachim Jeremias wrote a book called Infant Baptism in the First Four Centuries. That ended the discussion of the problem of infant baptism for this reason. What Jeremias points out in that book, and it's basically about 90 pages. Anybody can read it. It's a phenomenal book. What he points out in, in that text is this. The Old Testament concept, the, the theological understanding of relationships at that time, not simply in Judaism, but within the ancient Near East, was, as the Archbishop pointed out, it was patriarchal, it was hierarchical. He calls it the principle of solidarity. And let me give you, let me give you uh, one illustration. Oh, there's numerous illustrations. I'll give you one illustration. Do you remember Joshua chapter 7? you remember Achan's sin? 
Remember Joshua went into Jericho. I mean, not at Jericho. He went into AI. He conquers AI. And at least you think he conquers AI. And on the way back, he gets beat from AI all the way to Bethel. And if you actually map that out, that's like 67 miles. That's a beating. He got beat for 67 miles. He finally arrives in Bethel and he, tur Bethel and he turns around and he is told by God there is sin in the camp. What happens? He inquires, he inquires, he inquires. He finds out that Achan, in the battle, took some trinkets from Ai, which he was not supposed to do. He took, I believe, actually, I think he took some oxen or something or whatever it was, but he took something. When they were commanded specifically to go into Ai and level the Canaanites, kill them all. He'll sort them out. Kill them all. Simon de Montfort. Thank you very much. And he calls Achan out. Achan admits his sin. What does Joshua do given the command that he received from God? He killed Achan. And his household. Killed his wife. And he killed his kids. He killed the entire family. Think about Old Testament law. Specifically think about Levitical law. How is sin viewed in Levitical law? Any one sin, any sin, is viewed as infecting the entire nation of Israel, which is why when you see sins of um, emissions or oozing or these types of things, that's why people are put out of the camp for seven days. Because in the mindset of the ancient Near East specific, uh, in general, but the Jews in specific, the entire community was linked together. Therefore, one sin affected the entire community. Now, take that principle of solidarity and apply that to baptism. It is the, it is the father that makes the decision for the household because the father represents the household as Achan represented his household, as Christ represents his household, the body of Christ. So let me understand this, and I, and I, and I ask a question because I'm a little confused. And, and so, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, he took the sins, all of our sins, and paid the price for them while he was hanging on the cross. And he had that separation from God, and he, every person that has ever lived, he took, he took that. But during his baptism... Was, where? How does that fit into that final picture of, I mean, was he like sitting there and saying, I am baptizing and cleansing for the whole world, for, for all people through all time? I mean, is he, I mean, is it the same moment like on the cross, he's doing the same thing at the baptism? I'm a little, this is a very new question of Christ with humanity. Uh, in other words, because we have to repent and be baptized, Christ had to repent and uh, had to be baptized. We didn't have anything to repent of, but he had to receive the baptism of repentance in order to fill out, to complete his fulfillment of all righteousness. It's the same way as, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, a great deal of attention is given to the fact that Christ did certain things to fulfill the law and the prophets. It's What we're talking about is the completeness of the humanity, the perfected humanity of Christ, which will then be offered upon the cross for the sins of the world, which is why... Um, there is a sense in which the whole of Christ's life and ministry is redemptive because he has to fulfill all things. That phrase comes up quite often in the Gospels, to fulfill all things, to fulfill all righteousness. And that's the relationship between Christ and the baptism of repentance, 
and when all righteousness has been fulfilled, this is the, the, the key moment in John's Gospel, uh, the, the turning point, you know, when the Greeks come to Philip and ask, we would see Jesus. Uh, and his basic react, Jesus' reaction is, okay, now the time has come. Because at that point, Jesus realizes that all righteousness has been fulfilled, so the whole thing must be consummated by his betrayal, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. At least that's the view I'm familiar with. Rem remember, the, remember the connection. Here's the connection. And I'll try and be concise. We do not have a high priest who cannot empathize, who cannot sympathize with us. That doesn't only mean in his aspect of being tempted by sin. It means in the totality of his humanity. Remember, Christ's life on earth, both actively and passively, this is what people forget, his active obedience as much as his passive obedience is instrumental in redemption. If Christ had simply been passively obedient, think about it in these terms. Jesus went to the cross. He was born, he then crucified. Went to the cross. He was passively obedient. He died for sin at that point. What did that do for us? Where does our righteousness then come from? It doesn't come from him because he didn't live a righteous life. There's nothing that he did to fulfill the law, so the law can't be attributed to our account. It can't be imputed to us. Everything about his humanity becomes instrumental in our redemption and our salvation. By virtue of the fact that he was born in a manger, that his mother had to wipe his butt, that he had diapers, that he urinated on himself from that point until the fact that he was nailed to a cross, and everything in between leading to his resurrection and ascension. His living every day under the Old Testament law. His ability to tell anyone that follows him, if you have a burden, come unto me. And the burden that Christ is referring to in that context in Matthew is the burden of the law. Because remember, everybody lives under the curse of the law. Everybody is required to be 100% obedient to the law, obedient, yeah, obedient to the law, and no one has ever been able to be obedient to the law for one second. Christ did it every second of his human existence on earth. That's why it becomes critical in the Jordan River with John that he undergo that one element that we look as being superficial and completely irrelevant, but it becomes paramount for his complete identification with us because then he takes that baptism mm -hmm. and he incorporates in that baptism the sacrament of the circumcision and now now what he did becomes our sacrament of circumcision it, and mm -hmm. that's what baptism becomes for us by his one act all right help i got one more question for you Bishop, but I'm going to change complete directions, but we're still in uh, liturgy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm uh, in my yearly reading of the Parsons Handbook. Mm -hmm. And I got a real, and I never noticed this before. So um, uh, it's about um, cleaning up the absolutions. So, yeah. Um, so, like, on when he's talking about the end of the outline of the service, when the celebrant has consumed what remains of the Holy Sacrament, the subdeacon gives him the wine and water, which he has handed to him by the clerk. Meanwhile, the deacon moves the book, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and he just, yeah. yeah, and he just mentions about the wine and the water. Then you go to the priest and the clerk part, and... Um, then he says, uh, and he takes the crew us to the south altar, pours a little wine into the chalice, priest holds and actually pours a large amount of water over the priest's finger in the chalice and a little into the patent. Then he fetches a 
a basin, your and towel, and pours it over the priest's hand and bows to him, and then the altar and proceeds to sacristy. Then he switches over when he says into the service in detail um, that he takes the chalice to the south, holds it out where the clerk who pours a little wine therein, and then he drinks the first absolute, still facing the altar. The second part, he drinks the absolute part previously used in the bowl. And then he last fingers of both hands so the thumbs, four fingers can be joined over the bum. Then he pours a little wine and water over the thumbs and the four fingers and then more water into the chalice. And then the priest holds the pat in his left hand for a little water and board there then as he empties his chalice, which he holds into his right. He turns and drinks a second absolute and careful the chalice is properly rinsed and he consume the absolute quietly without ornamentation and without delay. Then he lays the chalice sideways, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, and then he turns to wash his hands at the south Born of the altar. Yeah, so yeah. three contradictory points in the Parsons handbook. No. No? Okay. It's high, versus, it's high mass versus low mass. You have to sort out uh, Dima's verbiage a little bit. Um, basically, the three, ab the three ablutions are <coughs> wine and water, into the chalice and wine only into the chalice to clean the chalice wine and water over the fingers into the chalice to finish cleaning the chalice and then just to make sure a little extra water and then finally as an inversion of the sequence at the offertory the priest washes his hands before leaving the the altar where it gets a little bit confusing is that when it's priest and clerk, it's relatively simple to do. When you've got the subdeacon in there, it becomes relatively more complicated because you're passing stuff up and down the conga line. The other thing is, Percy Deemer at times could have used a darn good sub-editor. Um, because... You have to remember the edition we usually use is the 12th edition. And by that time, he had rewritten it four times. And there are odd things that creep in that are kind of like, whoops, he forgot to go back. He forgot to go back and alter that. Uh, what the Alcuin Club book says is. <clears throat> Oh, the other thing is the, the seven-column uh, synopsis comes from the Alcuin Club book, and it didn't quite get revised to fit Deer's left-hand directions. Uh, but what the Alcuin book says is, for the ablutions, the priest turns back to the altar and reverently consumes all that remains of the Blessed Sacrament. He then holds the chalice for the subdeacon to pour in wine as the first ablution and drinks this. Then, while he holds the chalice in both hands, with the thumb and first finger over the bowl, the subdeacon pours water over them. The priest then drying his fingers with the purificator takes up the pattern on which the subdeacon pours water only, which the priest empties into the chalice and consumes all the contents of the chalice. He leaves it in the midst of the altar, laying on its side. That's because in the Middle Ages, they didn't use a purificator. Laying on its side, and goes to the south corner to wash his fingers, which done, he returns to the middle of the altar. Then, with the deacon and subdeacon on either hand, he descends from the altar, turns with them, and bows towards it, and follows the deacon into the bed. Now, about 50% of medieval sources do not mention a separate washing of the chow, of the pan. So, you know, you've got a lot of editorial decisions being made there, so you just follow as closely as you can. So is that our, is, is um, that more our directive of the process? Uh, the, the, the trouble I have is I'm not really into this whole Roman concept of real tight uni uniformity about ceremonial. Um, it's fairly common for me 
to take the ablutions in the manner that was done in the 11th and 12th century, which is just simply that whoever is assisting you with the altar, a large quantity of white water over your fingers into the chalice, and you just swill, dry your fingers, then swill the chalice out and take the ablution, and you just use the water. Um, other people like you get in the Alcuin Club directory of the Parsons Handbook, they're working off 15th century English rubrics where things are much more complicated. Um, one of the good points of the liturgical movement of the 1920s, the 1930s and the 1940s is that they tended to emphasize the big picture move away from being quite so obsessive about the minutia of um, liturgical practice. Um, to give you an example of how various things used to be, um, amongst the in various English editions of the Missal, you get some very different directives as to when the bread and the wine should be prepared during low mass. The usual monastic practice was to prepare the elements between the epistle and the gospel. Uh, the usual parish practice was to prepare the elements before the service began. Uh, so, you know, this idea of absolute uniformity is a, is comes out of the Congregation of Rites, post-1571. Uh, it's, it's not something that's particularly associated with the earlier tradition. Basically, the old, the late medieval tradition in England was three ablutions, the first of wine, the second of water and wine, the third of water only. The first two were done in the chalice, the last one was done in the ewer. So that everything was clean and tidy. Well, just FYI, before I quit and let other people ask questions. So Sunday, um, you know, I, I prepared like normal. I, I prepared the chalice before, left it on the credence table, and then put it at the altar um, at the proper time. And then, you know, and then I followed that exact cleanup ritual except for washing the hands in the bowl which i've never done afterwards so and then even after the service i removed it back to the credence table but um for your service on sunday and i think that's pretty well how you pretty much follow too so all right well i'll let other people ask i don't worry about details that much because i've read enough liturgical books to realize they all contradict contradict each other on the details whilst being consistent on the broader action. Yeah. All right, well, I'll let other people ask questions now. Uh, I, can, uh, can I jump in now? Yes. Okay, I want to go back to a little bit what we were talking about, uh, what Father Paul Castellano and Bishop were talking about with baptism is and I'm not going to go into it in detail because we don't have time, but another major root meaning of baptism is identification. And I noticed that both the bishop and Father Paul used that term a few times as they were explaining it, and that is, is quite correct. So think of it this way. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, as they very eloquently stated, he was identifying with us in our humanity. When we're baptized, we are then identified with Jesus Christ as Christ the victor and in his redemption, sanctification, and all of these other things. Uh, take a look at the Israelites going through the Red Sea. When Moses, or when Paul is writing about that in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, all were baptized unto Moses. Now, if you were to say all were immersed into Moses, that doesn't really make sense, but it makes perfect sense that they were identified with Moses in him delivering them from the land of Egypt. And then the second point I just wanted to make is that, and we just talked about this in my church in a couple of sermons, is look at how the baptism of the Holy Spirit is described. 
You see it in Acts 2. You see it quite a bit in Acts 10. Words of like falling upon, being poured out. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then we see Peter saying, who can forbid water for these to be baptized who've received the Holy Spirit just like we did? And how did they all receive the Holy Spirit? By him being poured out, falling upon the particular people. So therefore, a baptism, I'm not against immersion, that's certainly legitimate, but the pouring of water on someone and, and tying in with the washing, which Archbishop talked about, is just as scriptural in my mind as is immersion. So keep those few of those things in mind as well as you're thinking about it. Okay. I think I'm going to be kept busy all week this week because uh, trying to pull together some sort of common theme between matrimony, visitation, the sick and burial, but dad's going to give me some work to do. That sounds like a stand-up comedy routine just waiting to be written. Yeah, I'm not very good at stand-up, though. Um, you no, really? <laughs> we, we wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> Pure English all the way. It's got to be sarcastic humor. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that with me. <laughs> uh, well, I see that eight o'clock is creeping up on us, so uh, I, I'm going to leave you guys in peace and, unless anybody's got another question. We good? We're good. Bye-bye, everybody.